Welcome to the Pursuit of the Perfect Race. I'm Coach Terry Wilson, and with each episode, I bring stories of athletes to you that share their experiences at races in order for you to learn how to have your perfect race. We will hear stories from athletes of all ages, abilities, and races of all distances. So regardless of where you fit in, there's something in there for you. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let the pursuit begin. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me back. Looking forward to it. Uh, you know, I was um, beginning of the year when they announced it. I kind of looked at it. It was like, oh, that's Ireland. Kind of cool. Um, thought about it beginning of the year and then just decided I would see how the next several races went back in the early season. Um, and then I actually officially put it on the schedule about the end of July. I decided I was going to just go over there and see what would happen. It looked like there weren't a ton of guys going to be going over initially, so I thought it would be a good chance to go over there and see what I could do. Wow. So going into this race, how was your training? It was uh, pretty good. I think it was – I had raced Boulder a few weeks before that um, and had some really good training and then had a pretty bad race in Boulder and then just kind of took that got home and then was able to put in a solid 10-day – of um, biggest bike week of my life. Put that in the week before the race. Um, up to swimming a little bit and then um, did some very specific race uh, runs off the bike. Um, so amped it up quite a bit um, and felt pretty good about what I had done leading up to it. I have done, I started the year with a, a Galveston 70.3, and then I went from there, uh, May, I did Chattanooga 70.3, and then in June, I did Costa Rica 70.3, and then August was uh, Boulder 70.3, where I DNF'd, and then um, done Lowry this past weekend. Wow. So, coming off the DNF, what's it like for you to actually go It was my second time um, since racing, so I've been racing for quite a while. Um, so second time ever to not finish a race. Wow. So was that pretty tough for you, or were you okay with that? What was that like? You know, initially when I, uh, when I DNF Boulder, I got a little upset with myself um, and just for let myself down and felt like I kind of let some other people down. Um, but quickly within about a day and a half i was actually able to get over that and i was like all right you know what has happened so it's time to we've got a, a few days um, leading up to dun lowry to get some work done so i tried to just have a positive uh mindset and uh, got back and uh just put it behind me and got ready for the next one so far i'm loving it um i'm uh I feel like I'm steadily everything, pushing the limits, um, improving across the board, um, racing well. Um, very good decision that I made, I think, in the offseason last year to make the switch. Leading up to this one, um, I did three weeks out. I did a two-hour run, um, which was kind of race-specific, so lots of intervals, um, and ended up doing, I think that was an 18-mile run. Um, so that was the longest run leading up to that. And then my longest swim, I think I did a like 6K. Um, that was two weeks out. And then eight days out, I actually did 100 and – so six and a half hours, so I got a little over 120 miles on the bike. So, you've had a lot of confidence going into this race this season. 
I definitely felt good. I felt like my swim, I'd kind of earlier season been uh, not having the type of swims I liked. Um, so going into this one, I was feeling pretty good about my swim. Um, and then all the biking that I had done in Boulder for the few weeks I was there, and then the biking the week before this race, I was feeling, I felt good. I mean, my bike was feeling good. The numbers were, I felt like they were there. So going into this, I was feeling really good about the swim and the bike and then the run. I wasn't 100% sure what was going to happen there. I typically do three to four bricks a week. Um, basically, anytime I'm going to be doing a run, whether it's a track workout, long run, whatever it is, I typically always do some type of riding before. Um, so sometimes it's just an hit and then into the run. Um, and then on the weekends, I would do my long into my long runs. I am using just about 100% science and sport. Um, I use their gels, their electrolyte powder, their energy bars. Um, so I always start out with that. And then on some of the longer sessions, if I can't quite carry all the calories I need, I'll, when I stop and refuel the quick stores, sometimes I'll grab a Coke and some beef jerky is usually my go-to. Um, but typically, it's, um, I'm able to take on enough science and sport to get me all the sessions. It's, uh, it's, I'm still learning. It's, um, you don't know what to expect every race. You don't know who's going to show up, art list, but usually everybody doesn't show up. For me, it's a learning experience. Every race I go to, I'm trying to learn something new, um, learn from the guys that have been doing this for much longer than I have. Um, so going out there, going hard, but also trying to learn every time. I missed a little bit. Um, back in May, right after Chattanooga, I wrecked my bike. Um, I'm not really sure what happened. I was out riding the week after Chattanooga, so this was at the end of May. Um, wrecked my TT bike in the middle of a long ride. Um, Went and spent the afternoon in the hospital. Luckily, didn't break anything, just a uh, pretty bad road rash. Um, so when that happened, I actually was was out for two and a half weeks. Um, so I was feeling good going into end of May. Training was going really well. And then that happened. Um, out for a couple of weeks. And then it was kind of building back into it. And that's where... <laughs> Try this again. Yes, yeah, try that again. So if you can't hear me, just let me know because I can hear you fine. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no worries. All right, so where were we at? Leading into this one, the only training I really missed was uh, back in May, right after Chattanooga 70.3. The week after that race, I had a, a little bit of a tumble on my TT bike um, out on a long ride. So I spent the afternoon there, and the hot cleaned up. Uh, didn't break anything, just lots of road rash. Um, so that put me out for about two and a half weeks. Um, so I got pretty antsy there because the season was just getting rolling. So um, that one was hard because I couldn't do anything. Um but after that, I just built back into it. Um, luckily, I didn't feel like I lost a whole lot of fitness. Um, so we rolled back and then got a solid Yo, yo. 
Yeah. 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 Y
it's easy to just get consumed in the training and the racing. Um, so when I am in town, I do train out of town a lot. So when I'm in town, I just make a point to try to get a session done in the early morning and then spend a little time with my wife before she heads off to work. And then I'll do my second session. Um, and then I try to make a big point is when I'm here to be completely done with all workouts when she gets off work in the evenings. That way I can spend the evenings with her. Um, and so it works pretty well. Um, just once in a while, there's a, you know, there's a session that's crammed in in the afternoon, but um, just kind of one of the sacrifices that, uh, that I have to make. Yep. So I got there, um, and I actually had uh, one of my athletes was decided he wanted to come tag along, so he was already there um, when I got there. Um, so I linked up with him at the airport, and then we actually stayed in an Airbnb about five kilometers from race site, um, so easy to ride your bike there. Um, and I stayed there with another pro from Colorado, Chris Schroeder, and then another pro from New York, uh, Tim Russell. So there was four of us staying together um, that were all racing. I do not. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so this was honestly the first trip that I was kind of 100% like in charge of finding the place the other guys going with me were like, hey, you know, let me know what you find, but we trust you. So typically I end up going somewhere and I get lucky that somebody else has already found it so I just can show up. Um, so I had found a few places leading up to it. Um, didn't book them fast enough that were right by the race, so I lost those. Um, so the one I ended up finding – based off the photo and, and communicating back and forth. Sounded like it was a pretty good place, but the lady made it sound like it was really small, really far from the race, almost kind of trying to turn us away. Uh, and, I mean, we got lucky. It was a three-story little town home, right by a grocery store, right by restaurants, super quiet neighborhood, and actually a really spacious place. We actually got very lucky on We did not. It was um, for this race. It was pretty easy to take a bus. It was like a maybe a thirty minute bus ride from the airport to close to where we were staying, and then race site and everything else was close enough to ride your bike and or you could take a five minute taxi ride. I don't think we we contemplated it, but I ended up deciding that we didn't need one, and it ended up being the right call. Wow. Uh, for Ireland, all you needed was a passport, um, nothing else. So it was pretty cool. Nice. So when are you going to the check-in? How was the check-in process? And what was the vendors that were It was pretty smooth. Um, it's kind of funny. We got there, and, and I got there Wednesday. We did. I did packet pickup on Saturday. Um, and Saturday, it was kind of like a little cold. It wasn't too cold, but it was. It got down to like the 50s, so it's like we're going to pack and pick up in jackets and gloves and pants. Um, and it was missing, so it was a little rainy. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, vendors were the typical. You got your nutrition, the Iron Man, um, Norma Tech was there. Um, a rather small um, venue, but it had what you needed. Um, and the check-in was pretty straightforward. Um, and I think, honestly, I think we were some of the – me and the guys I was with were – some of the first ones to check in so there was I don't even know if they were quite set up yet it was pretty uh, pretty relaxed and we were in and out I'd say maybe five minutes we were out of there wow. yes yep now, you know it was pretty pretty usual to what um, what we have here in the states um, I didn't know what to expect because I'd never been there but I but luckily our Airbnb had a full kitchen with everything you could need. So leading up to the race, 
I actually was able to go to the store and get all the normal things I eat back home. Um, most of my cooking um, before the race right there at the house just to keep it simple. I keep it pretty basic for the most part. Um, typically in the mornings I eat oatmeal um, and with either oatmeal or some granola and that just kind of gets my day going. Um, and then some kind of, I like to eat like turkey sandwiches or a salad for lunch and then some type of rice or pasta and a protein and a veggie for dinner. Um, and I pretty much do that and eat the same thing almost every day. Uh, we were not supposed to. Um, we got to the meeting. The meeting was at the meeting was at two thirty, I believe, and the check in for the bikes was up until I think it was four p.m. So we got to the meeting, and they're like, "Hey, everybody has to have their their bikes checked in today." We talked to the race director, me and the guys that were staying a little ways away, and he was like, "Hey, just be here by five thirty in the morning and bring your stuff, and it won't be a problem." So technically, we were supposed to check in Saturday. But we were able to ride our bikes down race morning um, and set up everything then. I tried to, um, the morning before, I tried to still kind of keep it pretty similar to what I usually do. Um, but I usually, I woke up this morning before the race and I went and did a short little spin and a short run. And I did that off of, I just got up and ate a banana just to go out. And uh, so kind of a fasted, I usually do that. I don't really know why I do it. It just seems to work. Um, and then when I'm done with that, I make sure I get a big um, oatmeal um, toast, get like a, a good size breakfast. And then just, I hydrate. I mean, I'm hydrating all the time, but I just try to really the more, um, take some electrolyte tabs, get some in. Um, so I do that and then try to eat a big lunch and then eat a little bit earlier dinner so that I can start winding down, um, for, for, uh, going to bed. Yep. So, yes and no. Um, I still, I still kept it pretty simple. Um, but this is, uh, I guess, for me, was the first time where you a race where your bike's in transition, but all of your other stuff is in. Um, you have a run bag and a bike bag that's in a tent. Um, so I had never done that. So that was just a little different because got there and you just put your bike and your nutrition and then you have a bag with your shoes and your helmet in it and then your run stuff. Um, so that made it a little different, um, but I still was able to, I mean, I rolled down there with just what I was going to need for the race, nothing extra, um, with the exception of taking the run bag and the bike bag they had given us, but it was still pretty pretty straightforward and pretty streamlined. So I got the, um, got down there, um, so I rode the bike down, get the bike set up, get the rubber bands on the shoes, double check, make sure nutrition's there, um, make sure the bags are ready in the, in the changing tent, and then I got that set up pretty fast and then actually got down to swim start. I think I was down there a good 45 minutes before um, race start, maybe a little longer. Um, actually, yeah, I was down there right before 6, race didn't start till 7. Um, so got down there, did a little stretching, got a little jog in, and then as soon as they opened the swim for a swim warm up, I was I was wanted to get in the water as soon as possible. So. So I usually like to just get in and swim for a few minutes, and then do a few uh, just kind of like takeout sprints just to, for you know twenty seconds just to get that speed um but this race the water was i believe they said 58 degrees at race start um so this water was 
very cold. Um, so for this one, I just wanted to get in the water and just swim for a little while just to try to warm my body up a little bit and get used to the water because um, it, it was very cold. I'm not used to the very, I'm not used to the cold water. Oh yeah, because you know we're used to to swamps here, so <laughs> big change. It was pretty clear water. Um, the sun was when we started. The sun hadn't quite come up, um, but it was pretty clear. We had swam um, the Friday before in the afternoon when the sun was up, and you could actually see several feet down. Um, so race morning, a um, little overcast, but as we got about halfway through the swim, the water actually cleared up, and you could see a good bit of ways. Um, but there was quite a bit of chop, um, good bit of wind, so it was a little bit of a rough swim, I'd say. I wanted to go out and... I mean, I always go out and try to swim as hard as I can, but I knew, like, I knew Andy Potts was going to be there, and so there's a few guys that I know are much better swimmers than me, so my goal was to just try to get close to them and see what happened and just stay with them as long as I can. Look, unfortunately, this race, within about 200 yards in, uh, Potts and two other guys were off the front, and I kind of found myself in no man's land for the remainder of the swim. Correct. Yep. I was trying to keep the three guys so I could see for a while the three guys up front. For most of the swim, they weren't really swimming. Um, they weren't drafting out of each other. They were just side by side. So they were splashing quite a bit. So when I'd go to sight, I just would look straight ahead and over the chop and just try to see the bubbles. Um so I was able to just, I was like, I'm just going to keep going. Um, first turn buoy, I think we went out almost maybe eight or 900 yards to the first turn buoy. And when we took that left turn, I could see that I was like a minute 15 back, give or take. And then I just took a quick look back and realized I was about 15 seconds up on the, the next group. So I was like, right, I'm just going to, I was just trying to stay smooth, but also keep going hard um, to try to minimize the gap to the guys in front. But I also was trying to not let the guys behind me catch me. I think it, you know, I was actually pretty happy with it. Um, it was, uh, for me, it was a pretty rough swim. Everybody, but there was a lot of chop. Um, I don't know if the swim was long. I mean, we were in, we were in the water for a very long time. Um, but overall, at least this is one of the first races this year that I actually felt, um, like I like to when I'm swimming. Like I felt like a swimmer a little bit. Um, so overall, I was pretty happy actually. I don't believe they did. Um, and if they did, I didn't see them because I just I got out, ran into the changing tent, and um, took my wetsuit off in there. I I actually don't think they had them there. Yes. So it's uh that's where all of our gear was. So, uh, coming out of the water, you had a swim cap, goggles, and, um, wetsuit. You take them off and then the bag that your helmet and bike shoes were in, well, just your helmet. Cause my bike shoes were on the bike, but, um, you have to put your wetsuit and everything in, put it back on the hanger. Right. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't think, know if any of them do actually. Yep. Yep, yep. And that was also a year too. Now, at the end of the swim, what was it like? What was your expectation of the bike? Did you have a strategy that you wanted to sort of have planned or plans for ready? Or did you want to swim? So, for this one, um, Luckily, I think one of the best things I did leading into this one, honestly, was the day I got there on Wednesday was I made a point. I knew this was going to be a hard course. I didn't know how hard it was going to be. Um, but when I got there Wednesday, I went out and I actually rode the entire course um, because I wanted to. I knew it was going to be long. 
lots of climbing. So I wanted to really try to get a feel for the course. I did not want to race this course behind. Um, so I did that, and I'm so glad I did that. Um, and then when I came out of the water, I was 225 down from um, the front guys. So I got on my bike, and when I was mount, when I was getting on my bike, I looked back in transition and could see that I was only maybe 22, 23 seconds ahead of, um, I think, three guys. Um, so I was like, all right, I don't want to wait for them. I'm just going to get on. Um, I had no power expectation. My goal was to just ride the course as well as I can and then see what happened afterwards. Correct. It was full of um, everything, cracks in the road, lots of climbing. Um, we had a lot of rain, fog. Um, we had grease on the road or um, oil on the road. Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure what the grease and oil was from, but um, like when we did the climbs, the first big climb, we started descending, and there's some pretty bad S curves um, and just lots of like a surface of oil all over the road. Um so very um, small, narrow roads, lots of twists, lots of turns. Um, so when I got on the bike, my goal was to the first few times, the first little bit was um, just a gradual climb, nothing crazy, just um, nice to get into the rhythm. So I was just trying to ride as hard as I could for the the first part of the bike because I knew the hills were coming. Um, so I was just trying to ride as hard as I could and try to minimize the deficit to the guys up front. Wow. Hundred um, percent. This is this is one of those courses that. So I knew, based off of riding the course, um, I knew there was going to be very few groups. You know, a lot of the, a lot of races, you could, you'll you'll find groups of guys that are together. Um, this is a course that, with all the turns and just the way the terrain was, I had a good feeling that there would be very few groups together. And it's also one of those courses that. Riding that course um, by yourself, I think, could really take a toll on you because you do have to pay attention, but also with the elements and how hard it was. Um, it was that type of course that there were several sections that if the guy was honestly 30 seconds in front of you, you would have no idea because of the way the road twists and turns. Um, so it was one of those courses that can, can also get very lonely. You know, I, I think if I would not have done the course beforehand, I know I keep saying that, but it's like that's that's like my number one tip for anybody doing the race, if they ever go to this race, ride that course. Um, I, w I actually felt like I executed about as best as I could on that course. Um, 30 minutes in, I caught the guy that was sitting in third. Um, I passed him on a hill, and he had no response, um, didn't go with me, um, and then – about seven minutes later, I saw Andy Potts up the road, and I was like, all right, I got to go catch him. Um, so as soon as I – I kind of put a surge in, um, but I felt good at the same time. I was kind of trying to hold back a little bit on the downhills just because I knew the hills that were coming up. Um, I actually felt great through that entire bike. Like, as painful as it was, I felt great, and I was I was having a blast on that bike course. Wow. Now, did you Uh, luckily for me, um, it was smooth selling, um, no mechanicals, um, no flats. I do know, I, I know one other pro, he, he, he went down on one of the descents. Um, but besides that, I was, I was, um, fine getting through the course. Wow. 
step yep. into the feature. So for this race, um, I typically run an arrow bottle between uh, my arrow bars, um, and then I just kind of refill that, and then I run a bottle behind the seat. Um, for this race, I decided that I was just going to run two regular bottles because I knew that more time would be spent out of arrow versus in arrow, um, and you had to be alert. So trying to get down and get a drink out of that, I just made the call the day before that I was like, I don't think that's going to be a great idea, um, and I didn't think I would lose anything by running a standard bottle. Um, so I had two bottles, went through it, went to the first bottle in the first like 30 minutes. I went through that one pretty fast. Um, and that was just straight water. Um, I did swallow a decent amount of salt water. So I wanted to have regular water to just kind of wash that out. Um, and then I had my science and sport and my gels in my front bottle. Um, everything was going great. I think at mile 16, I hit a bump and somehow both of, I had two gels on board. They both fell out of my, uh, my little box on my top two. So I lost those. Um, and then I made a point to, I was trying to get the bottles empty. So at aid station two, that was around mile 30 or a little bit past that, that I could get bottles, new bottles. Um, so I got up there threw both my empty bottles, missed the, uh, <laughs> past the aid station. It was actually on an uphill, but I somehow missed the bottle. Um, so I got a little discouraged, but I was like, all right, well, there's nothing you can do. You got to keep going. Um, aid station three comes along and that was actually kind of on a downhill, which I didn't think was a great spot to have it. Um, made a point though. I was like, all right, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to make sure I grab a bottle. I missed three bottles. Um, so from mile 30 on, I actually had, I took on no nutrition. Um, so that was a little hard, but you know, I kind of had to just, you know, it happened and I was like, all right, I have to, I got to keep going and I got to just do the best that I can. Yep. So I was, um, mile 30, I went, I was bone dry. Yep. From my, yep. And so, and also this bike course with all the climbing, I mean, I had also, I really needed to get that on board because this bike course was, um, the fastest bike split was a 224. So if that tells you anything, um, we were out there for a good bit longer than we, than we, than we typically are. Right. Correct. I had, you know, I actually felt pretty good coming off the bike. Um, I wasn't sure how it was going to go cause I didn't know I was, that I hadn't had nutrition for a while. So kind of in my head, I was like, all right, I've got to get on the run. And I've got to start getting nutrition in to try to um, try to catch up. Um, started the run. Um, I was actually golden through. It was a three loop run. Um, first loop went by great. Um, felt good. Was hitting the aid stations. Um, I typically wait a while to go to the Coke and the Red Bull, but I just had a feeling I was going to fade pretty quick. So from the get go, I was grabbing water um, and then Coke and or Red Bull at every aid station. Um, and then, a, so lap one was great. Um, lap two went pretty well. And when I hit lap three, it's kind of like the lights went out and I don't know if, you know, I feel kind of like, I think the nutrition caught up to me, um, that and, or, I mean, I did, I went pretty hard on the bike. I was just trying to save nothing. Um, I was just trying to ride as hard as I can. So I think the nutrition, the riding that hard, I think it all just caught up to me. Um, and when I started lap three, it was kind of. My body just said no. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, mentally, I felt pretty good, and I was trying to push, just body would not go. I, I never walked. Um, I came very close to it, um, but I was running very slow. I think I was around, I think the last lap, I honestly think I was averaging like 715s. Okay. Okay, so let's see Compared, yeah, you know, I, um, that was 10 minutes slower than what I ran at Galveston earlier this year. Um, 
and I think it was the I think I outran two other pro males. I think um, I was outran by almost everybody actually on the pro side. It was a pretty um, straightforward. Um, you come out of transition, and it's basically three out and backs per loop. So you do that three times. Um, so really good race for spectators and really good race to kind of see where competitions are at. I mean, super easy to see a guy and, and look at your watch and get a time gap to see how far ahead he was and then how far somebody was behind you. Um, but it was unassumingly, it didn't look hard riding it the day before. But you climb a little bit out of transition, um, and then you run out on the harbor. So you run out uh, close to a mile, actually, and come back. And so coming back in was pretty windy. And then the third out and back, you kind of climb a little bit, but also into the wind. So like it didn't look like a hard run, but the wind was picking up. And it was not a hard, hard run course, but I would not say it was a, an easy run course. Okay. So this is Yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, Galveston is, is three loops. Um, and this was three loops, except instead of a lot of winding, it was just, you, you go basically straight out, straight back, straight out, straight back. And you just repeat that. Wow. That seems like a, Oh yeah. Yep. So I typically, I typically take one, um, I take one SIS gel with me starting the run, and I usually can, because if my nutrition is right on the bike, I don't need that gel until about mile six on the run. Um, I actually took the gel leaving transit. I took that from the get go, and then I actually ended up having to take. I don't even know what it was, whatever brand of gels they had out on the course. I had to actually take, I took two of those on the run course um, because I had already used my science and sport. So I was just taking every anything and everything that was at the aid stations. I didn't have um, I didn't have a dark spot until so the whole run, um, me and Andy Potts we had we came off the bike together and we had I think almost six minutes on the next guy. So I mean the first the first out and back on the run I mean we did the whole out and back and we're getting off of that one before we saw the next guy. So I was kind of like whoa this is great and then lap two. I saw that the guy that ended up getting fourth, I saw, I was like, I, I can see that I still had about four minutes on him, but he was running very strong. Um, so starting lap three, which was just, just past the eight mile mark, I saw that I only had, I think it was less than two minutes on him. And I was like, okay, I got this. I can keep going, push a little harder. And then mile, it was about 10 and a half that he actually came by me. Um, I mean, he, he closed ground fast. And when he passed me, wasn't definitely like a I got a little discouraged just because I wanted to go with him and I and there was nothing I could do um so that kind of happened there and then I just kind of reset and tried to just keep pushing forward um so a little bit of a low spot but I felt like I was able to kind of get through that one pretty quick and uh just put my head down and keep going worst mile of the race <laughs> It um, at that point I was definitely just trying to get one foot in front of the other and um, get to the finish line, and I hit the last turnaround. I think I had at that point I think it was point nine to get to the finish, um, and I saw the guy coming on strong right behind me. Looked at my time and I realized I had a minute ten on him, give or take, and he was he looked hungry and he was running very strong. Um, so I tried to, I was trying to just keep finding that extra gear and it's like mentally I felt good. I just like couldn't get the legs to turn over. I just couldn't get my body to go any faster. Um, so that one was, um, 
iffy because I knew that guy was coming on strong and that last mile he put almost a minute into me. Um, and I ended up only getting him by, I think 12 seconds. Um, Oh, it was, I mean, I crossed the finish line, turned around and then there he was. So it was, that was hard, (laughs) man, because it was also at that point, there was so many other people on the course. So once you, once I hit that last turnaround, you couldn't really see, you know, if you look back, you wouldn't be able to see if he was coming up on you. So it was just, just run as hard as I can and try to get to that finish line. It was pretty painful, actually. I mean, as soon as I stopped, which is kind of funny because at that, at that point I wasn't running that fast. But as soon as I stopped, it got – because the temperature, it was overcast. Um, I think it was only in the 60s, but I just got really cold really fast. So I hung around for a minute, but I, I tried to get out, the, out of there pretty quick and um, go get some clothes on and get some, uh, some hot tea. That's what they had, had coffee and tea in the in the food tent. So uh, that's what I went to. Wow. So overall, what was your experience? Probably one of the coolest um, one of the coolest places I've been to and one of the coolest race experiences. Um, definitely recommend it. I mean, as challenging as it was, it was also like one of the prettiest places um, to put a race course on, honestly. Um, the, the water, super clear bike course, very challenging, but they had all the roads shut down for the bike course, um, both ways. So we had the whole road to ourselves. Volunteers were amazing. I mean, they had them everywhere out there. Um, the run people cheering. I mean, I, I would recommend this race for sure. I did not see any litter personally, um, but I did hear like the day after the race. I don't. I think it was maybe on the Ironman thread. I think some of the locals. I guess some people had accidentally littered out on the course, um, and I think the locals. Some of them were a little upset, um, but I didn't actually see any out there. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah, it's. I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah, no, you're right. So I will be racing Santa Cruz seventy point three. I believe that is in two weeks. So yeah. So I, I hit it. Um, so I got back from Ireland on. I got back Monday afternoon. So I took Monday off. I took Tuesday off, and then was able to hit it pretty hard these last few days. Um, this week coming up, I'll hit it basically the next ten days. So until Wednesday before the race, um, it'll be back to a normal routine: um, long rides, fast running, hard riding, um, lots of swimming, and then I will. I'll back that one down three or four days um, before Santa Cruz. Okay. Yes, I did. So yes. Like it's it pretty cool. Um, it was my, uh, this is my second podium, um, second pro podium. So it was one step up Costa Rica. I was able to get, they did a uh, top six made podium there and I was, I got sixth place there. So that was, that was a very cool feeling cause I'd never experienced that. And then this one was a pretty good feeling as well to get one step higher and one step closer to that top step. Um, so very cool. I mean, I was up there, Andy Potts is a legend in the sport and it was pretty cool to be standing next to him. Wow.
You know, it's pretty cool because uh, Andy Potts is 42 and he's still he's still very fast. I mean, he recorded the fastest run time there in Ireland. Um, and he's also one of the first um, one of the first pros that I met about 10 years ago when I was just starting out. Um, so pretty cool, pretty cool experience. Something I'll remember. I'll remember that for sure. I've got a few. I was uh, they kind of did the awards pretty fast. It was kind of like they called us up, got us up there fast, and then sent us on our way. Um, but I did get a few photos. Yes. Absolutely. I think um, going into this one, so going into Galveston, going to the beginning of the year, my build up to that was uh, one of the best build ups I've had for a race, and I felt like Ireland. Um, was the next race like this race I felt like my build up to this was getting very close to that build up to Galveston um, so I, I think we did it right honestly I stay on top of um, Normatec, in my opinion, is a big one, or just some type of recovery boot. So I'm in mine a um, couple times a week for sure after any big session. Um, and then foam rolling, um, stretching, strength training. It doesn't have to be a lot, but I think strength training actually can minimize a lot of, a lot of injuries um, that I think pe- some people overlook. Um, so that's a big one that, I think it's been a big game, a big game changer for me this year. Um, and honestly, <laughs> staying on top of sleep, sleep that works wonders. Honestly, it was pretty straightforward. I was, um, I really was shocked at how straightforward it was. Um, yeah, it was, at least, you know, there, everybody speaks English, so that made it really easy. Um, everybody was, everybody I encountered was very nice, very friendly. If we had any questions, they were willing to help us. Um, and I got lucky, no delays going there, so it was easy to get there. Bike made it there, um, and then even coming home was straightforward. Wow. Yes. Kona for sure. It's someday. Um, that's that's honestly right now that's the biggest one. Um, and right now I'm just trying to go. There's so many cool races out there, so it's like hard to pick. You know, like hey, which ones do you want to do? So I'm just trying to, if they fit in the schedule, just get to any and every race that I can get to. I do I do want to race a lot more internationally because there are some really cool places out there that races are put on. I do want to definitely bucket list. I do want to race in New Zealand. Wow. That's, pretty cool. that's what that's what I've heard. So they can follow me on Instagram at Elliot underscore Bach underscore try. And that is my, uh, right now that's my main outlet. I do have a Facebook page called Elliot Bach triathlete. Um, but, Right now, most of my um, traffic and things I post, um, everything is on Instagram currently. So the perfect. So if I was picking weather. The course, everything is that what you're is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Um, I'd like a swim like 65 degrees, so cold but not too cold. Um, salt water, but no chop, which, which is usually hard to find. Um, a hilly bike course with good roads, um, so smooth roads, lots of climbing, lots of descending to make it challenging, and then a run with like rolling hills, nothing hard. Um, but not bone flat. I don't like bone flat, and I don't like super hilly. Um, and I like I like looped runs, so two to three loops. Well, I don't know, thank you so much for 
es que vivieron seis experiencias para que vayan a la cama y la pinche vieja de cara. Ya viví en su vida. I think that's it. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to get him with us. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome. That was great, man. That was good. I yeah. like that. I think it was a little, a little better than the first one. Yeah, I'm being a fucking better than I'm hearing. Oh, no. What about me? I'm being a worm, so that's just not how I like it. Probably. Yeah. You could sound easier, but I like it. You could talk about your favorite thing. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think we did. I've been, I, th- I mean, I, what do we talk? We talked back in whew, April. Dude, I've been, I've been so up and down. I've been busy. I had my injury, like I had two injuries. Um, dude, I've been up and down because right after Galveston, I fractured a rib. I think I had told you that because I saw you in Chattanooga. I mean, I had a pretty bad wreck right after that. Um, and then I like, took a few weeks off. Um, I've been trying to grow my coaching business. Um, it's, I'm doing well, dude. I'm actually about to have to hire a coach. Uh, I'm getting to, I'm, 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 I am getting, um, I am, I am personally about to be maxed out. So I'm going to hire somebody to coach some of my beginners for me. Um, I just picked up, like, I just picked up my first, um, one of the guys actually that was racing with me in Ireland, he is a he is a pro himself. Um, he hired me, so starting this week, I'll be actually coaching him. He's a, he's another pro. I'll be coaching him starting tomorrow. So I'm, I'm pretty excited, dude. Honestly, um, and then I have I've got two other guys in the pipeline that they should have their pro cards by next year. One one guy's a local kid here, um, 22, so new to the sport, but dude, he's got the drive and the will. And he came like he came to Boulder with me, um, and then I've got a guy that is 25, just got out of the uh, the Navy, um, and he just wants to train full time for a little bit. So he's actually moving from New York down here for a little while to train face to face with me. Um, so I'm just uh, I'm trying to that's going it's going well, and I'm trying to get I want to have my full out like I want to have a full blown team next year. Um, so just trying to talk to sponsors. Um, get some deals figured out. Um, I just picked up, like, I'm, I'm going to be riding a Ventum starting next week. Um, try to get it sold. Yeah. Depends on who's buying it. <laughs> um, yep, so just trying, uh, just trying some new things. You know, Ventum, I'm going to give it a try because I've got essentially no money in it and some people don't like it, but there's fast guys on it. It's something that I can make it work that could turn into a nice little chunk of money for me. So, right. you know, I'm just kind of – things are, like, on the upward trajectory, but I still got a – I think I still have nine races left this year, so it's going to be a – like, I'm hitting 370.3s next month, so it's going to be a busy – yes, sir. Damn. So we're in uh, we're in Capel, like right by the airport. Um, like I can basically see the airport from my house. Yeah, you know I've actually been riding it a lot. It's actually a really good. I'm, it's a really nice loop. <laughs> I want to go to Boulder though, dude. That tra- train out there, dude. That's insane. Some of the best training I've gotten in. So, Freaking yep, just man. just trying to, you know, I mean, Santa Cruz is stacked, and then I mean, the thing is there's so many guys that race in the States, and so it, it's just getting hard. But, like, I'm racing Santa Cruz, and then I'm racing Augusta, then I'm racing Cozumel, and the two in the States are pretty stacked, and then Cozumel is a championship race, so that that's a pretty stacked one as well. But uh, I don't know if I told – I'm kind of keeping it on the down low, but I'm racing – I'm racing – I mean, that's kind of what the – that's why I'll – I'm – I'm doing an Ironman this year. I'm just not telling everybody, and so that's why there's so much training going on right now. It's all the build up to the final race. Cozumel. Yes, sir. You know, I like wind. Um, I like heat. 
I also like that fast swim. <laughs> Ah, I never heard of that. Uh-huh. That actually does make sense. I've never heard that, but that actually makes sense. That's smart. So, yeah, I want to know like how coaching is going, how podcast going. It's kind of like fill me in because like. Did you, who'd you talk to from Leadville? You got a guy named Ryan Moore on there? Are they, uh, are they all... Are they pros or they just did the ride? Oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> oh that sucks. <laughs> yes. I got a guy. If you, I got a guy, I'd like you to get on there. Yeah. It was a. It's a guy. It's actually a guy I coach, but it was his first. I think he's only done five tries, but it was his first seventy point three, and he went four fifty. Wow. Uh, his name is Sam Tooley. Sam. He's in the twenty five twenty nine age group. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'll get him. Um, um, so, Tule, T O O L E Y, I believe. Very nice. Yeah, I mean, you got some freaking legit people in there, dude. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Um, I mean, well, I mean, there are some out there. I can tell you that. I'm not going to give you names, but there are some dicks out there. And well, not dicks. It's just like you got to get to know him. Like, I don't like Starkey. He's fast as shit. But like, anytime I see him in a pro meeting, he just acts like a dick towards every other pro. So I have a bad, I have a bad taste in my mouth from him. But I think he also just. I don't know if he's an introvert. I don't know what it is, but like, he's just like not very nice to us in pro meetings. <laughs> wow! But he's fast as shit. Like the dude, he's freaking. He's a legend. Yeah. Right. When it. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Yep. Right. Yep. 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 Yep.
Ah, yeah. smart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's too long. Yep. All right. Absolutely. You can every um only thing it's not a big deal but um I noticed so whenever you mention purple patch you don't have to say Matt Dixon if you do that's fine but if you can cut that out because like I work with like Matt's overseeing it but like I actually am working with like Matt's right hand man it's okay, kind of man. a well his name is Paul Buick but it's like I just I work with purple patch because there's a lot of different people that see it so it's like if you say purple patch then it doesn't say anything wrong and it also doesn't um not say something right. That makes sense. It does. So, uh, I mean, no, I do. So, like, technically, my coach is Paul Buick, who is the guy that for most of the pros, but Matt Dixon oversees everything. Okay. And so, I don't work directly with Matt, but Matt knows exactly what I'm doing. But like, if I call a coach, I call my, I call Paul Buick, who's basically Matt, but not Matt. <laughs> it, it makes sense. Um, it's it's a, it's around the realm of. Uh, I mean, they charge amateurs. I think fifteen hundred. So, um, every pro pre, every. I can't tell you the number, but every po every pro pays. We all just pay depending on our situation. I think some pros pay more than I do because they're winning and I'm not. Um, but every every pro has to pay every month. But they're amateurs, yes, they charge. I do know like if you want to work with Matt Dixon personally, he's fifteen hundred dollars a month. Yep. I mean um, but when you're that good, I mean I mean, series really good. Purple Patch, they're really good. I mean, I mean they're I've on seen, the same level. I would, yeah, I consider them on the same level. I mean, I don't know if one's better or not. It's really just about the feel of what you want in the coaching. And the I mean, you mesh. have to find you have to find the perfect fit. Like for me, I mean, I have a lot of say in what I do, and that's what I really like because they're like, "Hey, you're a professional. You're also a coach, so you're not an idiot." Like. So I do have a say, like, I, I have, I do, I follow the schedule 100%, but I have a say in what I want to do. Like, some days, I make the call, like today, my swim was going terrible, I was supposed to swim 5K, I shut it down at 2K, just because, like, my body's just like, you're done. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go home, I'm going to rest, I'm going to reset, and I'm going to hit it harder shit tomorrow morning. Um, so, I do like that aspect, but I also like, I mean, I do some crazy shit, dude, and and some people think I'm crazy. I mean, before Ireland, people give me shit because, like, I rode the course Wednesday, dude, and it took me over four hours to ride that course. Jesus. And then I rode two hours Thursday, two hours Friday, hour on Saturday. So, like, I had over 200 miles on the bike the, uh, the week of the race before the race. Um, you know, people were giving me shit. The guys that I was with were like, dude, you're doing way too much. I was like, you know, sometimes I think I am, but let's see what happens on race day. And I beat every single one of them by quite a bit. And so, like, something's working. Um and like, dude, I swam ten. I had a ten k swim on Thursday. That was my swim. I swam ten k. God. And then he backs it up. 
with a hard, I mean, I rode 50 miles like balls out and then I did a 50 minute run like on the gas. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope you're able to learn something from today's episode. If you enjoy the show, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes or share it with a friend. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you'd like to see pictures from this athlete's race, learn more about who I am, what I'm doing, or be on the show yourself to share your story, check out my website at CoachTerryWilson.com. Until next time, continue the pursuit. I mean, my, my body shut down like uh, yesterday. I was supposed to run two hours on the trail, and I woke up, couldn't hardly move, couldn't hardly get out of bed. Um, I think I kind of myself. I did that 120 mile ride, and it was really hot on Friday. And I did that runoff, and I think that took me like I actually had I was cold on the run. It was 105, and I was cold. Like that's not a good sign. Um, and that messed me up for my trail run. I was supposed to run two hours. I got five miles in, stopped, took a break, got a gel, and somehow managed to get through four more, but it got to where I was like, I just, I can't go. Like, I cannot do anything else. And it's like, I wanted to, but it was not a, nope. I mean, I had taken the gels. I had taken, like, doing everything right, but I just could not get, like, if I would have tried to go anymore, I probably would have fell over and really hurt myself. Um, it's like, I walked that one in, dude and called it a day at I think eight miles and like it sucked because my run is my weakness but you have to be able to make those calls and I'm just like all right you know what I did some really good work now I'm just shutting it down and gonna hope that this week I've got a huge week coming up so we're just gonna stay positive and but I don't think I've actually hit my limits yet I don't know what my limits are so just trying to figure it out dude I need it to cool. I need it to cool down. Like it's, um, I mean, hopefully this helps though. Cause I'm like, I'm doing some, I'm doing some, I got a lot of racing coming up. So I'm hoping that this heat will help a little bit. Hope so. so are you still in school? Yeah. Oh, shit. And how's the, uh, how's the coaching going? And you still, um, so how many do you, like, what is your, what is your number at? Yep. 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 And that's, you know, that's what you need. Um, no. So are you? Do you make – how do people make money doing podcasts? I always no. am did no, – does nobody make money from podcasts, even the best ones? Uh, I don't sponsors. Okay. So that would be what you have to get – is that what you have to get to where you have somebody right. – I don't want somebody paying me $10 per episode. I don't, you know, I'm giving them 30 seconds of money. Like, it's ah. not what I do. I, I don't do everything else. I never have to do anything. I don't think I'm going to receive a plug for $10. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so are you, um, are you, do you try to market? I mean, obviously, like, you know, you do the podcast, we all share, we listen to it, but like, do you have, do you try to go after it, or right now is it just like, just throw the podcast out and just get your name out there? Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yep. No, that's... No, that makes sense. That actually, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I like the way you're thinking. Sounds good. Appreciate it.